Hello and welcome to the Swift Bird. I'm Yakov, the Bird Master here. Apple recently published the release candidate of Xcode 15, which means its development is finished. I think now is a good time to review the changes and see what's good and what's not. Xcode 15 doesn't seem revolutionary in terms of developer experience. But after a couple months using various beta versions, I've got a list of the changes I like and those I definitely don't. Let's start with the good ones. One thing you're gonna notice even before launching Xcode is the new way it's now distributed. Instead of one huge bundle that includes everything for every platform, now you get a fairly compact app at under 4 GB. It includes the code editor, debugger and the macOS SDK. But if you develop for the iPhone or Apple Watch, you're gonna have to download the SDK separately. Same is true for tvOS and visionOS. So if you wanna build apps for every platform, that will result in a whopping 24 GB download. Of course, it's not just about splitting one file into many. This module structure actually allows Apple to update each of the components individually, so getting an update for the core editor shouldn't require you to re-download the SDKs. You could already see this in action. During the beta testing period, Apple published multiple versions of Xcode which relied on older SDKs. In addition to offering separate downloads, Xcode 15 also introduces a new mechanism for discovering the additional runtimes. When you download the bundle, you also get a small manifest file. On first launch, Xcode uses this manifest to copy the runtimes instead of downloading them over the network. In my experience, it didn't always work though, but in that case, I used the xcrun command and added the runtimes manually. As a side note, this is isn't Apple's first step toward modularizing Xcode. Last year, it already unbundled the watchOS and tvOS SDKs, leaving just macOS and iOS runtimes included by default. That somewhat reduced the download size from 10 to 7 GB, but this year's change is definitely a welcome one. Another welcome improvement is the updated version control tools. In Xcode 15, Apple redesigned the check-in model window to be just a regular tab, which you can switch away from anytime. You can also stage changes one by one right from the code editor. The one thing still missing is the line-by-line -line staging. I often use it to save batches with unfinished work while keeping each commit buildable, reorderable, and cherry-pickable. For now, I'm still gonna need GitHub Desktop because it's one of the few free and open-source Git clients which support that. Maybe next year things will change for Xcode, but honestly, I don't believe it. And now a couple bad things. A few years ago, Xcode introduced the command menu. You could open it by clicking on some code while pressing the command key. You could use the menu to find the function's colors, go to its definition, or view the documentation. In SwiftUI, the same menu offered many useful actions, such as wrapping a view in a stack. But also, there's always been the normal right-click menu. I mostly used it to access refactoring options. In Xcode 15, Apple seems to be moving away from this duality, with all options available in the right-click menu. Command clicking on a code structure just opens a definition. Technically, you can reconfigure this behavior to toggle multi-cursor, but I found this feature to be broken. In my opinion, this change doesn't really clean up the mess. Instead, you get a mix of code-related items and text editor actions, such as copying, pasting, or adding text to music as a spoken track. Wait, what? I'd definitely like to see some clear vision here. Now, did you know you could use Xcode as a CI server without installing something like Fastlane and even touching the command line at all? Well, you could, but you no longer can. That's because in Xcode 15, Apple removed the Xcode server feature. In short, this feature allowed you to set up a local machine that accepts jobs from other computers on the network. It can build projects and then run tests on them. The new Xcode version completely removes this feature. I'd speculate Apple did so to push developers toward its paid Xcode Cloud service. Starting this December, it will no longer offer a free tier. And Xcode Cloud's prices can bite, ranging from $15 to $400 a month. There's even a petition on the developer forums to restore Xcode Server. With Xcode Server gone, Apple's cloud offering is basically the only way to configure continuous integration with just GUI. Other services, such as GitHub Actions, require you to write and maintain configuration files. It's not very hard, but it does take some time to learn the syntax. I've been using Xcode Cloud since the closed beta. I like its setup simplicity, but I wouldn't say it never caused me any trouble. Sometimes things break, and you still need to go through debugging logs. I wouldn't be very surprised if at some point Apple requires you to use Xcode Cloud for the builds you send to the App Store, because you know, it's more secure. Of course, it's just my wild speculation at this point, but we'll see. 
As a bottom line, I'd say the new Xcode version is kinda okay. It ships with new frameworks and a few usability improvements, such as the updated version control. The deprecation of Xcode server looks alarming, even though it wasn't my primary CI setup. And Swift 5.9, also included in Xcode 15, deserves a separate video. You'll see it next week on this channel. That's it for today's Swift Bird video. If you learned something new, give it a like and subscribe to the channel. You can also support me at the links below, but that's completely optional. Stay tuned for future videos, and until then, make your code fly!